just to give you a sense of uh, orientation uh, once more, uh, we have divided the course into two main sections. The first, the biographical historical. The second, uh, the theological. Uh, we are still uh, in the first part of the course, that is the biographical historical. Uh, we are going to take a look at Wesley's life uh, up until his beginning of field preaching, uh, which happened in April of 1739. Uh, the last time we met yesterday, uh, we were talking about uh, some important books uh, that Wesley read, um, as well as uh, a spiritual friend that he had encountered. Um, we mentioned the work of The Imitation of Christ, uh, and we also talked about Jeremy Taylor's work, uh, Holy Living and Holy Dying. And so, when Wesley, as uh, an older man, looked back upon this period when he was a young man, uh, he couched it or he expressed it in the language of real Christianity, real Christianity. Um, for example, um, later he wrote a sermon, uh, in what sense we are to leave the world, in what sense we are to leave the world. Uh, and in that sermon, Wesley wrote these words, quote, when it pleased God to give me a settled resolution to be not a nominal, but a real Christian, being then about 22 years of age, my acquaintance were as ignorant of God as myself. Uh, and so you can see here, that Wesley is very much concerned uh, in his ongoing biography with the importance of being, as we said yesterday, a real, true, proper, scriptural Christian, okay? Uh, and so uh, this is an important part of his journey. Uh, we're going to see this again, not only in the biographical material, but we'll also see it fleshed out quite clearly in the theological part uh, of the course, okay? Um, now, <clears throat> no one, of course, is doubting uh, that Wesley grew up in a pious home. We know he did. We talked about that yesterday. He grew up in a very good home, um, with Samuel and Susanna as his parents, but even a person who grew up in that home needed to be transformed. Needed, he knew he was missing something uh, and that he yearned for it. He had, as you might, as pietists would express it earlier, he had pious desires. Um, and so, we make a distinction between being virtuous and moral, let's say on a personal and social level, uh, and then uh, being redeemed, uh, which is more than being moral on a personal and social level. Uh, and so that will be uh, helpful to understand. Uh, maybe I can illustrate that point um, through alcoholism, for example. Uh, let's say a person has a problem with alcohol, okay, and they recognize that they're an alcoholic, okay. So they go, let's say they go to a 12-step program and they get sober, and we rejoice with that, those folk. And that actually is the prevenient grace of God in operation. But watch this, I want you to see this. The fact that the person got sober does not necessarily mean they're redeemed uh, because there are all sorts of people who are sinners who never had a problem with alcohol, okay? And they're still sinners. 
because why? They're curved in on themselves. And it's a curvature, a self-curvature that they cannot break by themselves. They cannot solve the problem of the self because the self precisely is the problem. Okay? Uh, and so we're making a difference here between the moral, the personally moral, the publicly socially moral, which is a good thing. It's an expression of God's prevenient grace, but that doesn't mean you're redeemed. Because to be redeemed, and we're going to see this very clearly in the theological part of the course, to be redeemed is not simply to be moral and virtuous, but also to be, here it comes, holy. To be holy. To be holy. Meaning the Holy Spirit uh, is in our hearts transforming us transforming the tempers, the dispositions of our hearts, as we talked about yesterday. And we, of course, received the forgiveness of sins. And that's basically what Wesley means by redemption. We have things to fill out, of course, to be sure. But the reception of the forgiveness of sins and the renewal of nature whereby, and it's an important transition, being steeped in our sins, we become holy. Holy. This wonderful, gracious gift given to us by the Holy Spirit who is mediated to us through the means of grace um, and also through the sacraments. And so, although Wesley, at this point, he's, he's, you know, if we're talking about the period 1725, you know, he's a young man, he sees the goal. He sees the end, what Christianity is all about. It's holiness. You know, it's holy love. Uh, it's, you know, consecration, devotion to God. But at this point, he doesn't understand the proper means. In other words, how is this going to be realized in his life? How is he going to become holy? How is he going to receive the forgiveness of sins, okay? He doesn't have that in place yet. He's confused about it, actually. He's quite confused about it. Um, as a matter of fact, if we look at Wesley's understanding of faith, his understanding of faith in 1725, uh, it's deficient. It's deficient uh, in lots of ways because He's having correspondence with his mother. They're going back and forth. Remember, practical Christianity, he turns to Susanna. And they're talking about what is saving faith. Uh, and this is what Wesley writes, quote, Faith is a species of belief. A species of belief. And belief is defined as an assent to a proposition upon rational grounds, okay? Uh, faith must necessarily at length be resolved into reason. And this is Wesley's understanding of faith at 1725. Now, no one is doubting that this is, an, this is a part of what saving faith is. It is. In other words, this is belief that. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I believe that Jesus Christ rose from the dead. Or as the New Testament says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and that God raised him from the dead, you know, you'll be saved. But don't that, let that last verse uh, uh, lead you astray. It's not simply a rational affirmation. The person who can say Jesus is Lord and believes in their heart that God, raised, uh, that God you know, raised Christ from the dead, that Christ was raised from the dead, that person uh, has not only engaged reason in belief, but the heart as well. And we'll see that. We'll see that clearly uh, as that works out. But Wesley has a very rationalistic understanding of faith in 1725. We call it fide faith. Um, we can use the Latin, the Latin expression fide. Fide faith, this is belief that. In other words, affirming the basic truths of the Christian faith, which are important, and that is an important part of faith, 
but it's not the totality of faith. And so we're going to have to talk about faith in another sense uh, as well. And then, so Susanna receives, thank you, Susanna receives this letter from her son where he's talking about faith as a species of belief and being resolved into reason. And then she writes back to him, she writes back to him, all faith is an assent. An assent, in other words, uh, an affirmation. An assent, an affirmation, uh, but not all. Uh, but all assent is not faith. Uh, some truths are self-evident. She wrote, and we assent to them because they are so. Okay, um, that basically, S Susanna Wesley, in her reply to her son, is basically defining faith as a census. There's another Latin word for you, uh, a census. And it basically means to affirm a proposition, it's true, such as Jesus Christ is the Son of God, Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So you can see here uh, that Wesley does not have a full-orbed understanding of faith. Faith is really a thing of the mind, a thing of the intellect. It is resolved into reason. It is the affirmation of the basic truths of the Christian faith. But now watch this. You can affirm all the basic truths of the Christian faith, be doctrinally orthodox, and remain in your sins. You, 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 you see the difference here? And, and that's Wesley's problem, because yes, he affirms the basic truths of the Christian faith. He doesn't deny them. He affirms them, but he finds in his life that he is untransformed and that he is unholy and ongoingly so. Okay, that, that's going to be his journey, his journey leading up to, leading up to Aldersgate Street. Okay, so during this year of Wesley's awakening, 1725, he's spiritually awakened. He sees the invisible spiritual world. Uh, he has a rather deficient view of faith. Now, we know that ascent, um, an intellectual ascent, is an important part of the Christian faith. It, however, it's not the whole thing. It's not the whole thing, because Wesley later on is going to write, faith is not only an ascent, but also uh, a hearty trust, a hearty trust in God, uh, in, in Christ and faith in Christ specifically. And that word we use when we talk about faith in terms of trust. In other words, relationship, belief in. I believe in Jesus Christ. I am related to Jesus Christ. I trust in Jesus Christ in a personal, relational way. That's not simply a cognitive thing, although it includes the mind, but it is much more. It includes the heart as well. And for that, we have another Latin word for faith, fiducia. Fiducia. And this, this word, you can see, we talk about fiducial relationships in economics, and it's a relationship of trust. Uh, but fiducia basically means here trust. And it's relationally understood. Relationally understood. Okay? Wesley's not there yet in 1725. He's not there in terms of fiducia. He's still very much in a fide world. Uh, rational assent, affirmation, those sorts of things. Uh, he is looking, searching for that faith which will transform uh, the tempers and dispositions of his heart so that he will worship God not only, notice this language, not only but also, not only with the mind, but also, also with the heart, with the will. Um, and so this is an important uh, part of Wesley's transition here, okay? Now, um, we talked a little bit yesterday uh, about Wesley's plans for ordination. 
Uh, and so he pursued, he continued to pursue that path. Uh, and so with the blessings of his parents, you know, Samuel finally got on board <laughs> that with the blessings of Susanna and Samuel, John Wesley was finally ordained. Uh, he was ordained a deacon in the Church of England on September 19th, 1725. And he was ordained by Bishop Potter, Bishop Potter, uh, the son of a Yorkshire merchant. Uh, and so you can see that, again, 1725 is a very important year. Wesley is ordained. He's ordained a deacon. In the Anglican Church at this time, two-tier ordination. Ordination first to deacon, then ordination to priest. Okay, so it's two-tier. He's first ordained deacon here. Uh, and the newly uh, ordained Wesley continued his studies at Oxford. He continued to study. Um, and he was elected, and people were talking about this yesterday, he was elected a fellow of Lincoln College on March 17, 1726. Uh, he was elected a fellow of Lincoln College. And his father took some sort of fatherly pride in this uh, because he writes upon learning of this, quote, what will be my fate before the summer is over, God knows. You know, uh, Samuel was always in financial difficulties. Uh, but wherever I am, my Jackie is fellow of Lincoln. Uh, uh, and so he, he took some fatherly pride in the achievements of his son that John Wesley was elected a fellow of Lincoln, of Lincoln College. Um, some months later, uh, in November 1726, Wesley was elected uh, Greek lecturer. So Wesley's knowledge of languages was very good, uh, especially Greek. Um, and he was a moderator of the classes. Uh, and so he is functioning uh, at Oxford as a teacher. He's teaching Greek. Um, um, he's a Greek lecturer, and he's moderating some classes. Um, Wesley's further education entailed uh, receiving the Master of Arts degree. And he received the Master of Arts degree in 1727. And he delivered three lectures. You know, people were asking yesterday, you know, what was Wesley studying? Well, we know something of what he was studying uh, at the master's level by the lectures that he gave uh, for the degree. Uh, and he delivered one lecture on the soul of animals, the soul of animals. Did you realize that animals have souls as well? They do. Uh, uh, and then a second uh, talked about uh, a, a, a lecture on Julius Caesar, a lecture on Julius Caesar. And then thirdly, he lectured on the love of God, the love of God. Uh, and so Wesley is well situated there at Oxford. He's thriving, he's growing, uh, he's prospering spiritually. Um, he's corresponding with his mother Susanna in terms of practical Christianity. And in January of 1727, uh, there, was some, there were some letters that passed back and forth between mother and son. Uh, and Wesley uh, begins to give very strong evidence of his increasing seriousness uh, in terms of religious matters, in terms of religious things. Uh, and so uh, he recounted in this letter that he's writing an earlier conversation that he had with Robin Griffiths. Do you recall that name? Do you remember that name? You do. Uh, that might have been uh, the spiritual friend who was so important to John Wesley during the year 1725. Um, and this is what he wrote in this letter, recalling a conversation that he had with Robin Griffiths. Quote, about a year and a half ago, 
I stole out of company at eight in the evening with a young gentleman with whom I was intimate. Uh, this is 18th century understanding, not 21st understanding. Uh, be, be aware of that. Uh, as we took a turn in an aisle at St. Mary's Church in expectation of a young lady's funeral with whom we were both acquainted, I asked him if he really thought himself my friend, and if he did, why he would not do me all the good that he could. He began to protest, in which I cut him short by desiring him to oblige me in an instance which he could not deny to be in his own power, to let me have the pleasure of making him a whole Christian, to which I knew he was at least half persuaded already. Okay, And so this emphasis on being a whole Christian rather than half a Christian um, was Wesley's desire for his closest friends, in this case, Robin Griffiths, uh, and for himself as well, for himself as well. So such an emphasis, this kind of ongoing emphasis in Wesley's life made him appear as serious and earnest uh, to his friends and made him appear as eccentric to his enemies, okay, uh, to his detractors. Uh, and so there's an increasing focus and seriousness in Wesley's life during this time. You know, many people would simply say, how could a rector's son at Lincoln College, Oxford, not be a whole Christian? Okay. The logic was inescapable for some, though it was doubted by John Wesley himself. And the fact that Wesley doubts this, he doubts that he's a whole Christian, he does. If you read his journal, I mean, you, you, later on in his journal, read the letters of this period, uh, he does doubt that. And that makes him biographically interesting. He's interesting now because he's different. He's different than how people usually view this whole area. He's sort of over here, <laughs> you know, saying that, well, I'm not a whole Christian. I'm not a real Christian, but I desire to be one. I desire to be one. Um, now, in August of 1727, Wesley left the uh, comfortable environment of Oxford and headed to Lincolnshire to serve as his father's curate uh, at Epworth and then at Root. We talked about the two parishes that Samuel had. Um, and in this pastoral setting, so John Wesley's functioning as a pastor, he's helping his father in the ministry of these churches. Uh, Wesley's also reading, he, you know, he constantly is reading. You know, it's very interesting, uh, uh, but I'll pause a, a little story here because it illustrates the importance he attached to reading. Uh, there were some uh, of Wesley's lay preachers um, and Wesley spoke to them and he said, you must, you know, constantly be reading. You must continually read. And they said, the reply was that they didn't have a taste for reading. And you know what John Wesley's reply to them was? Develop a taste for reading or get out of the ministry. Yes, that's what John Wesley wrote. And you know what? Wesley is right. Wesley is right. Ministers, pastors, ongoingly so. Just continuous education. It's very important uh, to be a faithful witness to Jesus Christ in a complicated world, whether we're talking about the 18th century or whether we're talking about the 21st century. Okay. Um, and so Wesley naturally is reading. Uh, he even read on horseback uh, later on, fell off his horse a couple of times. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, during this period of time, 1729, he's reading William Law. Now, William Law is a contemporary. William Law uh, uh, is uh, an Anglican and wrote the work Christian Perfection. Christian perfection, which of course is going to 
interest, John Wesley. And then William Law also wrote a serious call to a devout and holy life. Now, he read these 1729, possibly 1730. We can't nail down the exact date, but this is roughly the period of time he read these works. Uh, William Law was an interesting figure. Uh, he was the mentor of both John and Charles Wesley uh, for a period of time. And then they have a parting of the ways. We'll see that as, when we get to the year 1738. But before that time, the Wesley brothers are looking up to William Law, this godly Anglican who's written these important works, spiritual classics, um, uh, Christian Perfection and a Serious Call to a Devout and Holy Life. Um, and William Law was a man of deep principle. Uh, he was what we call a non-juror. Remember yesterday I told you that in England, politics and religion are always intermixed? We saw how that played out with Susanna in not affirming uh, William of Orange, uh, William and Mary coming to the throne. Uh, <clears throat> William Law ran into a similar problem uh, because the British, in terms of the succession, uh, at this point, uh, just a little earlier, had invited uh, Hanoverians, uh, George I, George II, it becomes, you know, becomes the line of George I, George II, George III. We call this the Hanoverian line. They come from Hanover, which obviously Germany, and, and indeed uh, George I could not speak English. Uh, he spoke German. Uh, and he is brought in uh, to become the King of England. Uh, William Law did not make the transition. He did not make the shift. Uh, and so he was referred to as a non-juror. He refused to take the required oaths of allegiance on the succession of George the First. Uh, so, in other words, the succession was William and Mary. After William and Mary, there was Anne, and then there was no direct heir after Anne. So they reached out to Hanover, the house of Hanover, and brought George over to start the Hanoverian line. Uh, and William Law did not follow suit and could not, in good conscience, take the oath of allegiance to the British monarch. So that gets him in all sorts of difficulties, uh, as you might imagine. He lost his fellowship at Cambridge, uh, though he recovered somewhat by becoming the tutor of Edward Gibbon. Edward Gibbon, who is the father of the famous historian, you know, the, the decline of the Roman Empire, all that. Um, so. Whereas the works of Akempis and Taylor had shown Wesley the importance of purity of intention and entire consecration to God, William Law's writings introduce Wesley to what? This is very important, very important in the Christian life and, and is often neglected, especially by Protestants. He showed Wesley the importance, and this is very easy to remember, showed Wesley the importance of moral law. So you think of William Law, showed Wesley the importance of moral law. In terms of what? In terms of its height, its breadth, its depth, its extent, okay? Uh, William Law communicates that to Wesley because the moral law is none other than the express will of God. Wesley, later on, will write an important sermon called The Original Nature, Properties, and Use of the Law. And in that sermon, he will refer to the moral law as, listen to this language, a copy of the divine mind. A copy of the divine mind. The fitness of relations established in a created order, okay? Uh, so, you know, it's even moving in a kind of direction of moral and natural law. In other words, the creator so creates that there is a fitness of relations in the things that have been made. Uh, the moral law is a copy of the divine mind. In another way, the moral law is the form of God as we are able to bear it. Uh, uh, in other words, we can look into the law, we can gain wisdom, we can gain insight, because 
you know, as we're on our way to knowing God and being transformed, uh, in other words, the transition from sinner to saint, if there were immediate contact with God, in other words, immediate revelation of God, it would be devastating. It would be overwhelming. It would be awful in this sense of the word. You know, terror, <laughs> sort of even. Uh, and William Law says we can look into the law and sort of approach God and begin to see God um, uh, in terms of the divine wisdom. Uh, as a matter of fact, since we're here, we might as well make the point, uh, we can express salvation in another way. You know, I, I understand people define salvation in all different ways today, okay? Politically, therapeutically, all different ways, okay? Uh, I'm going to continue to bring forth biblical and Wesleyan understandings, John Wesley's understandings of redemption, and here we're at one of them. We're at one of them, that salvation, salvation is the transformation, the transformation of our being. In other words, from sinner to be made holy such that, such that when we discern the divine presence, we do not turn away in shame. Okay, and in a real sense, think about it. You know, remember I told you, keep thinking about the big picture. All of us, all of us, everyone in this room will someday see God face to face. Okay, we will. We will see God face to face. Okay, salvation in a real sense is preparation for that encounter so that we don't turn away in shame, but that we can look up and say, Abba, Father, Abba, Father, okay? So that's one sense of understanding salvation. It is the transformation of our own being, our own dispositions and tempers of the heart, so that when we begin to see the divine beauty and glory, we do not turn away in shame or in guilt, you see? We look up, we're... Abba Father, we are the sons and daughters of the living God. We are the children of God, uh, having received transformation. So until then, though, because Wesley's thinking, uh, certainly when he's reading law, he's thinking of the sinner who's steeped in their sins, who's under the power and dominion of sin. They can get up close to God through the moral law. They can look into the moral law and see, uh, understand God, the things of God, deeply so, deeply, e deeper and deeper. Okay, so this is important. A year or two after Mr. Law's Christian perfection and serious call were put into my hands, Wesley writes, these convinced me more than ever of the absolute impossibility of being half a Christian. What did Jesus say about the half or the lukewarm? Jesus said, I spit you out, okay? And so Wesley is, folk, he's got that image he's working with, and he doesn't want to be a halfway Christian. He doesn't want to be in this halfway. He wants the real deal. He wants to be all the way in. Uh, and so he's writing here, these convince me more than ever of the absolute impossibility of being half a Christian, and I determined through his grace to be all devoted to God, to give him all my soul, my body, and my substance. But watch this now, you know. Um, you know, this is the latter part of the 1720s into the 1730s. How does Wesley think he's going to realize all this? He, here's what he writes. By my continued endeavor to keep the law, to keep the his whole law, inward and outward, to the utmost of my power, I was persuaded that I should be accepted of him and that I was even then in a state of salvation. Now, what's Wesley saying there? Well, it's obviously theological error. He's making mistakes. He is. He knows the goal of religion. He knows the end or goal of religion, which is holiness, holy love, but he doesn't know how to get there. 
He doesn't know the means to realize that in his life. He thinks, and, and several Anglicans thought so in the 18th century, and that has something to do with the heritage of the Caroline divines in the 17th century. He thought by keeping the moral law inward and outward that he would be made right. He would be made right with God. Now, we know, what's another way of expressing that? Wesley's basically teaching here uh, salvation by works. That's how he's understanding it. You know, I, I have to be good enough. I have to practice the moral law inward and outward and do it well, and then I shall be in a state of salvation. Well, that's not what the New Testament says. New Testament does not say that. It says quite the reverse, actually. Uh, quite a different thing. But Wesley's got this all jumbled up right now. It's all confused in his mind, which is good for us. Why do I say good? Because Wesley, in a sense, lived a paradigmatic life. Now, what do I mean by that? He lived a paradigmatic life, life of, of a paradigm. Because Wesley, as a Christian, made so many mistakes that his life is wonderful for teaching purposes. Because you can say, don't do this, don't do that, don't go down this alleyway, don't take that fork in the road. Because John Wesley did all of these things and failed. And failed again and again. But that's good for us who come afterwards because we can look at that and say, okay, yeah, I'm, I'm not going that way. So that's what I mean when I say, John Wesley lived a paradigmatic life. Uh, he struggled. He made all sorts of mistakes. That's helpful to us for teaching value because we can direct uh, folk to the proper means of grace. Okay, let me take some questions or comments that you might have. <clears throat> Okay, I think I got this. Uh, questions, comments? Yes. Вот он получается читал лекции о любви Бога в университете, а в то время не было это запрещено. Yes, I do. Yes. You, you mean to lecture on religion? Oh, no, you, you could lecture on religion in Oxford University in the 18th century. Uh, because as I indicated uh, earlier, that um, the, the Anglican Church is the established religion. And if you go to Oxford, you know, you see St. Mary's right there, intimately related to university life in the 18th century. And so it was not a problem uh, for um, a student getting a degree uh, to lecture on the love of God. That would be quite appropriate at Oxford in the 18th century. Now today, in the 21st century, because England is so secularized, you know, people might, you know, roll their eyes or something like that or make objections, but not in the 18th century. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay, I'm sorry. You're going to have to repeat that again for me. Thank you. I'm sorry. Yes. Yes, a very good question. It's sort of a follow-up to your question. She's continuing uh, 
what you're saying. I've actually studied a lot in this area. I have great interest in it. Um, we are in a different place today um, in the 21st century in terms of public universities, especially in Europe and especially in North America um, and, and elsewhere even. Uh, and so given our history, and I'm thinking of the history of enlightenment, the rise of science, and a whole bunch of things coming into play, um, that our cultures uh, are uh, very secular. Uh, they're very secular. In other words, it, it, God is not celebrated or at times in my culture, North America, even tolerated. Um, there are many, I can speak for North America, there are many in North America who don't want to hear at all any public expression of God. They say that's private language. It has to be removed. Now, I disagree with that because uh, I see it as a matter of censorship. Uh, I am free to speak about my Christian faith, whether I'm talking with you or whether I'm talking outside to someone on the street, uh, because that is who I am as a person. And if you tell me that I can't speak about Jesus Christ or God, you are telling me to stifle who I am as a person, and I refuse to do it. Okay, And so I think in North America, where our culture is becoming increasingly sec secular, there is also pushback, lots of pushback now. People are saying, we will not be censored. We will not be censored. We will speak freely, even in the public square, even in a, 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 a country like the United States where there's separation of church and state. Everybody else gets to talk the way they want to talk. Christians are not second-class citizens. They're not. And, and so this is a struggle going on. It's going on in the United States right now. Uh, and, uh, but it's an indication of where we are today. Now, you know the European situation better than I do, but I, I think in some respects Europe is more secular than the United States. It's more secular, <laughs> that these trends uh, have been more advanced. And someone told me, and I've heard this more than once, that Estonia is the most secular country in Europe. This is what they tell me. Uh, so you know what I'm talking about. So I have a word for you then uh, for the Christian community here in Estonia, that you don't have to self-censor yourself. You don't have to say, I, I cannot speak about God. I cannot talk about Jesus Christ uh, in public. If someone were to ask me, oh, how would you define the good? Or, or what is social justice? Well, or, or something else. I'm going to talk about Jesus Christ. And, and if you come in and say, oh, no, you can't do that. Oh, yes, I can, because you can't censor me. Do you see the point? Do you see the point? Uh, the way you frame the issue is very important. Uh, see, in my country, in the United States, they like to frame it, oh, separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. But what they really mean is separation of church and culture. Religion is a cultural phenomenon, okay? Groups practice it in lands and cultures, and you're coming in and saying, well, all of this has to be censored. No, no, no. It doesn't have to be censored. I believe in open and free conversation. Everybody gets to talk. And we will do well in that context. The church does well in a context where everybody can say what they want to say. The church doesn't do well when someone comes in. You know, you could think of you know, what the Soviets did in their times where they come in and say, no, you'll be silent. You cannot speak. You cannot talk. Uh, or they put so many restrictions on you, you can't express. But we don't have to accept that. And, and we shouldn't. And we shouldn't. So I like your question. It's very good.